In this chapter, we'll cover monopolies. The most important concept in this chapter is the relationship between marginal revenue and price, MR and P, for a monopolist. Everything else in this chapter, markup price, economic profit, deadweight loss, public policy responses, so on and so forth, all flow from the relationship between price and marginal revenue. This relationship is also important because when price is greater than marginal revenue for the, the price is greater for, than marginal revenue for firms with market power and um, in other market structures such as monopolistically competitive firms. Since price is greater than marginal revenue for these firms, many of the same issues um, arise. So there's a, there's a whole uh, gaggle of, of issues that arise when you have a market failure like a monopoly. Um, for most students, the relationship between price and marginal revenue is the most challenging topic in the chapter. So be sure you spend some time on that in the reading as well. Um, this PowerPoint includes an active learning exercise that requires you to calculate the marginal revenue at various quant uh, quantities from a demand schedule. So you, you will see um, for yourself that marginal revenue in this example is less than price. The PowerPoint also includes... Uh, care, a careful explanation of uh, on the relationship between margin revenue and price. So I hope that you will find it helpful. Another tricky concept um, for some of my students is identifying the monopolist price on the graph. Um, students generally can find the profit maximizing quantity where marginal revenue and marginal cost curves intersect but they sometimes forget to go up to the demand curve to find the highest price the market will bear at that quantity. Again, the monopolist is always going to try to chase that highest price. So I'd like to encourage you to um, read the um, excellent In the News box in this chapter. It discusses the price discrimination at colleges, which you might find interesting, and debunks a common myth, uh, common myth about college costs. So let's get started. As an introduction, a monopoly is a firm that is a sole seller of a product without close substitutes. In this chapter, we study uh, monopoly and contrast it with perfect competition, which we covered previously. Here's the key difference. A monopoly firm has market power. That's the ability to influence the market price of a product it sells. So, uh, a competitive firm has no market power. So, most most of my students already should know that a monopoly means that a firm is only seller of its product, uh, but the definition here has another very important part. In order for the firm to be considered a monopoly, the product it sells must have no close substitutes available um, from other firms. So um, we kind of take the monopoly defi definition a little further and emphasize that its product is completely unique. So why do monopolies arise? Well, the main cause of monopolies is barriers to entry. Other firms cannot enter the market. There are really three sources of barriers, uh, three sources of, that create barriers to entry into the market. The first one could be a single firm owns a key resource. For example, the De Beers firm, or it's really a De Beers family, owns most of the world's diamond mines. So if you control all of a scarce resource, uh, it's much more easily uh, easy to be a monopoly. Second reason, uh, or second causes for barriers to entry is uh, the government gives a single firm the exclusive right to produce a good, um, say, be it uh, patents or copyright laws on a good um, that's wholly unique. Now, the third reason for barriers to entry are natural monopolies. A single firm can produce the entire market quantity at a lower cost than, than, other, uh, than could other several firms. Um, good examples of natural monopolies are um, your local power company. Um, you wouldn't want six different companies running power lines up and down the roads when you can have one do it um, call it more cost effective. Uh, at a more cost-effective rate and um, deliver power to all the homes. So that's, that's an example of a natural monopoly. Um, so for example, a thousand homes need electricity. Uh, look at the horizontal axis on this graph which measures the number of homes provided electricity and the vertical axis measures the 
average total cost of providing electricity per home. Now, average total cost is lower if one firm services all 1,000 homes than if two firms um, each service 500 homes. Now, for power companies, this is because there's a lot of infrastructure involved in setting up a grid, so you wouldn't really want to um, have to set up two separate grids. It becomes cost prohibitive. So it's much more easily for a natural monopoly like Duke Energy, SENG, depending on where you are in the state of South Carolina, other power com uh, companies in other areas, um, have a lower average total cost. So they can provide power to homes um, at a lower cost. So let's take a look at monopoly versus competition in terms of demand curves. In a competitive market, the market demand curve slopes downward. That's what we've talked about demand from, you know, since day one in this course. Um, but the demand curve for any individual firm's product is horizontal at the market price. Again, this is for an individu individual firm. So emphasis on the first one is a market demand curve slopes downward. Emphasis on market. So that's all those firms added together. But the demand curve for an individual firm's product is horizontal at market price. Why? Well, um, they have no no market power, so they basically have to supply um, their products at a at a set price, and then at that set price, you have many buyers that want to buy at that set price. Okay, um, so if price goes above that, all all the buyers drop off. So the firm can increase quantity without lowering price. So marginal revenue must equal price for the competitive firm. A competitive firm, again, is a price taker. It can sell as much as it wants at, at the market price. Again, in a competitive situation, you have many buyers and many sellers. In effect, the competitive firm sells a product for which there are many perfect substitutes. There's a lot of competition. So demand for its product is perfectly elastic. That's why the demand curve is horizontal there. If it raises its price above the market price, the demand for its product will fall to zero. The relationship between, and then naturally, they wouldn't charge less than the market price because they realize they can make more. Um, the relationship between price and marginal revenue is what distinguishes a competitive firm from a monopoly firm in, in terms of both the firm behavior and the welfare implications. So in the competitive situation, that demand um, is horizontal and mar uh, marginal revenue equals price. <coughs> Now, looking at a monopolist demand curve, comparing a monopoly to competition, the mono a monopolist is the only seller, so it faces the market demand curve itself, because it is the one firm. There are no um, demand curve for firms and demand curve for the market. Its demand curve is the market demand curve. So to sell a larger quantity, the firm must reduce its price. So to sell a larger uh, quantity, say the price is here, okay, we know demand would be here, they need to lower price, right? And we move out here and then the quantity would increase from around here to here, all right? Thus, marginal revenue does not equal price. So this slide introduces the notion that marginal revenue um, not equaling price for the monopolist. The next slide presents an exercise that will help you see for yourself uh, that the relation, what that relationship looks like. <clears throat> so let's look at the active learning activity here. Common Grounds is the only seller of cappuccinos in town. It's a hypothetical here. The table shows the market demand for cappuccinos. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is pause the, the video here and fill in uh, the missing spaces in the table. Now, what is the relation between the relationship between price and average revenue and between price and marginal revenue? So take a moment to think about that. Again, these are concepts we've covered in previous chapters. So take it a pause, take a pause and see if you can work that out. All right, on to the next slide. Here, price is equal to average revenue. Okay? Average revenue, again, is the additional revenue um, you get uh, based on price for each unit, okay? So um, here you're selling it, you're selling one uh, quantity of one at $4, so your average revenue is $4. Quantity of 
two at 350, so your average revenue is 350. Okay, and so on and so forth, all the way down to six in 150. That's that's price and average revenue. Now here, marginal revenue, which is the change from one unit, um, from from zero to one, one to two, two to three, and so on and so forth. Marginal revenue is less than price. Whereas marginal revenue equals price for a competitive firm. So we've gone from that competitive situation where marginal revenue equals price to a monopolistic situation where marginal revenue does not equal price. Okay. We see here we go from zero to four. Um, from four to uh, or the marginal revenue goes from four to three fifty is three, so on and so forth, up until the point we start losing money. Now, the numbers in this table are from the uh, previous exercise. So you can see either um, from that table or the graph, or from the table here or the graph, that at any quantity, marginal revenue is less than price. So again, demand curve is reflective of price because it's a single firm demand curve. So um, this is the individual firm demand curve which reflects price. So it at four dollars you sell one. At um, two dollars you sell three fifty. So on and so forth. Um, or excuse me, at at, at three fifty you sell two, and then at three dollars you sell three. At two fifty price you sell four. So on and so forth. Um, so that's their demand curve. The individual demand curve reflects um, the the quantity demanded for the market at each price. All right. Well, what we see here is they're not equal. Price and marginal revenue are not equal in this situation. In fact, marginal revenue stays below price the entire way. As illustrated both in the table, marginal revenue is less than the price okay, in each situation. And then if you show it graphically, marginal revenue is less than the price. So understanding the monopolist marginal revenue, increase in quantity has two effects on revenue. Well, first is the output effect. Higher output raises revenue. Okay, they can simply make more money by producing more goods. All right, that's something you can't do in a competitive market, but a monopoly can pull it apart. Uh, can can pull it off. Now it also has a price effect. A lower price reduces revenue. So if they they lower their price, which as a monopolist you wouldn't do because you have market power, you lose revenue. That's pretty intuitive. To sell a larger quantity, the monopolist must reduce the price on all units it sells. Hence, marginal revenue is less than price. Marginal revenue could even be negative if the price effect exceeds the output effect. For example, when common grounds increased quantity from 5 to 6 in our previous example, the marginal revenue became negative. All right. Note that, the, that a competitive firm has an output effect but not a price effect. The competitive firm does not need to reduce its price in order to sell lar a larger quantity. So for a competitive firm, marginal revenue equals price. So where do they want to operate? Well, they want to maximize profits, right? So in order to maximize profits, like a competitive firm, a monopolist maximizes profit by producing the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It's always where you want to operate as a firm. Once the monopolist identifies this quantity, it sets the highest price consumers are willing to pay for that quantity. It finds that price on the demand curve. Again, the demand curve is the schedule, um, uh, schedule of quantities that um, consumers are willing and able to pay for at different prices. So they're always going to find that highest price. So keep that in mind when we're looking at a graph. They're always going to trek up to the highest price. Now, graphically looking at profit maximization, uh, the profit maximizing quantity is going to be where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. All right? But we don't stop right here in terms of price. We find the price from the demand curve of this quantity. Again, this is what people demand. So we trek up. Unlike what we did in competitive firms, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue was also the point where um, price, uh, the market price was, in this instance we have a single firm uh, with market power, so price is going to trek all the way up here to the demand curve and be higher. That is the profit maximizing output, and this is the price that the monopolist gets to charge. Now, 
As with a competitive firm, the mon monopolist profit equals the price minus the average total cost times quantity. And again, this is profit. Okay. If we were just looking at revenue, it would be simply price times quantity, but we have to take out average total cost, um, looking at a per unit basis, um, to reflect the profit, not just revenue. We're looking at profit. So again, we see here we're operating our, our, our ideal quantity is where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, but because we are a uh, monopolist, we get to move all the way up to this demand curve. And the area that exceeds your average total cost where all this comes together, okay, we have our average total cost, um, is your profit, this shaded area here, this, this rectangle. Now, keep in mind, there could be a scenario where even a monopolist doesn't make money. So, say your average total cost was sitting up here, okay, and the curve sitting up here. There would be no profit to be had in the market, so even a monopolist could lose money. So, keep that in mind. In this example, anything that exceeds your average total cost, which is pretty intuitive, is profit. It's this rectangle area right here. A monopoly does not have a supply curve. Okay. A competitive firm takes price as it's given. Okay. It's a price taker. It has a supply curve that shows how its quantity depends on that price. Now, conversely, a monopoly firm is a price maker, not a price taker. They're a price setter. There's another way of saying it. They're a price maker. Quantity does not depend on price. Okay, we go back to this, this graph here and see that quantity that we pick, if it depended on price, price would be right here. Okay, but it gets to trek up to this demand curve because it's a monopoly with market power, so they're somewhat disconnected. So again, a monopoly is a price maker, not a price taker. So quantity does not depend on price. And quantity and price are jointly determined by uh, marginal cost and marginal revenue and the demand curve. Okay, quantity is determined by where marginal cost and marginal revenue equal. And then we trek up to the demand curve to find price. Okay, marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Come down here and find quantity. But with a firm, with a monopolistic firm, we can trek up to demand and our price is way up here. Okay. Hence, there's no supply curve for a monopoly. They operate simply off of marginal cost and marginal revenue, where they equal, sets the quantity, and then trek up to the demand curve, and we get the price charged. Now, here we're going to take a look at a case study of a monopoly versus generic drugs. Here we assume constant marginal cost for simplicity. Okay, constant marginal cost for simplicity. That's why we have a horizontal marginal cost curve there. Okay. Uh, the abbreviations PM and QM denote the monopoly price and the monopoly quantity, respectively. So this is the quantity that monopolist makes. This is the price that um, monopolist sets. Okay. Now, PC and QC denote the competitive price and the competitive quantity. So this is the price in the competitive market would be equal to marginal cost. And this is the quantity in a competitive market. All right. So patents on new drugs give a temporary monopoly to a seller. When the patent expires, the market becomes competitive and generics appear. So um, when you have a drug come out that's like a blockbuster drug, um, classic example that everyone uses is Viagra. Well, when Viagra was out, it was uh, only Pfizer had it, and it was a big deal. Okay, now as the patent expires, generic companies can start making copies of it. Okay, because the patent expired. Pharmaceuticals have about a 14 to 15 year patent, and after that period, um, people can make copies of it. All right, so um, generics start to appear. So they go from being a monopolist to a more competitive firm. So initially, a Pfizer with a Viagra would operate again. The quantity be determined by where market, or excuse me, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Again, we're assuming constant marginal cost for simplicity here. That sets the quantity for a monopolist. But a monopolist doesn't have to charge this competitive price when they're the only one making it. They can trek up to the demand curve. Demand's pretty high for a drug like that. 
and that means the price is higher. Okay, so the price is up here, quantity is over here. Now, um, as generic drugs begin to appear, the market becomes more competitive because there's more than one firm making things. Um, the the uh, the quantity then falls into more of a supply and demand situation here. Now marginal cost is essentially a cost schedule and a cost schedule is essentially a supply schedule and a supply schedule you can use to plot a supply curve. So here we move to the more supply and demand um, situation. Again assuming we have a constant marginal cost thus we'd have a constant supply curve so we'd have a horizontal supply curve. So things shift over competitive situation when the generics enter the market price comes down to price competitive and quantity goes up. There's more people making that medicine. Now there are welfare costs associated with monopolies. Now let's think back in a competitive market or a competitive equilibrium I should say price equals marginal cost and a total surplus is maximized. In monopoly equilibrium price is greater than the point where marginal revenue because marginal cost as we've shown several times now. Now the value to buyers of an additional unit um, at a given price exceeds the cost of resources needed to produce that unit which is your marginal cost. The monopoly quantity is too low and could increase total surplus with a larger quantity. Thus the monopoly results in a deadweight loss. And we learned about deadweight losses when we talked about welfare costs. All right. Um, now it's worth mentioning before we take a look at this slide that most people know that a monopoly changes the way the quote unquote economic pie is divided. Um, they charge higher prices and the monopoly gets more surplus and consumers get less surplus. So they take a bigger slice of the pie. Um, the analysis on this slide shows that a monopoly also reduces the size of the economic pie by reducing, by excuse me, by producing less, they can reduce the size of the pie by producing less than the than what the society efficient, uh, what is a societal um, efficient quantity. This can cause a deadweight loss. Okay, um, again, think of marginal cost here as being synonymous with a com competitive supply curve. So we know in a competitive situation where supply equals demand, the price competitive would be here where P equals MC and the quantity competitive would be here. Okay, So that's the classic um, competitive situation. Now we know in the case of a monopoly they're not going to operate there. They're going to operate where uh, marginal cost equals marginal revenue. That gives you the quantity but they're not going to charge this low price. They're going to trek up to the demand curve and charge this monopoly price. Okay. Well, the loss to society is both quantity and, and, and re they receive less quantity because they move from QC to QM, but they also pay a higher price from what would be the competitive price P up to this higher P, which is the monopoly price. Okay, So this whole area reflects the loss in quantity, QC to QM, and the increase in price from what would be a competitive price here up to a monopolist price. So this kind of oblong green triangle area is the deadweight loss. Now there's also issues of price discrimination. Discrimination is treating, as you guys know, is treating people differently based on some characteristic, for example their race or their gender. Now that's a little different in economics when we talk about price discrimination. Price discrimination means selling the same good at different prices to different buyers. Okay, the Selling the same good at different prices to different buyers is price discrimination. The characteristic used in price discrimination is willingness to pay, abbreviated WTP. So a firm can increase profit by charging a higher price to buyers who have a higher willingness to pay. So if you're just willing to pay more for a bag of Doritos, um, then your neighbor, uh, a firm can realize that and just charge you more. Okay. Now let's look at perfect price discrimination versus single price monopoly. Here the monopolist charges the same price, the price monopoly PM, to all buyers. The day weight loss you can see results here. Okay. Uh, they're going to operate where marginal cost, again we're, we're assuming um, for simplicity that this example this example assumes a constant marginal cost okay 
that margin cost co curve in a competitive situation is synonymous with supply. Okay. Uh, one more unit, what's going to cost me? How much will I supply? In this case, we're supplying this constant uh, amount at this price. Uh, our competitive situation will be out here where supply equals demand. Okay, but we know that's not necessarily the case with a the monopoly. They're going to operate with margin cost equals margin revenue, yet they're not going to charge this price. Okay, it's a constant price. They are going to proceed up to the demand curve because they can and charge this price for a monopolist. Okay, this monopoly price. Well, we know from the previous slide that this oblong looking triangle, right angle triangle here, is the dead weight loss. Now, this area where that is above their cost and up to the price uh, is the monopoly profit. Okay, just like the rectangle we talked about a few slides ago. Now, this area here, this green area is called consumer surplus. And if you recall, we covered in a previous chapter, it is the area above price below the demand curve. Technically, right here, there are some people that would pay a price that's higher than a monopoly price. Okay? But they're getting to pay a lower price and get more quantity. So that's the consumer surplus. Just a reminder, consumer surplus is the area above price but below the demand curve. So the demand is higher than... Um, there in this area demand is always a is in this green triangle demand is higher than the price that the market requires even in a monopoly situation so there is some consumer surplus in this example now here uh, the monopolist produces the competitive quantity but charges each buyer his or her willingness to pay so now we're looking at price discrimination this is called perfect price discrimination the monopolist captures all the consumer surplus that you saw before as profit, but there's no dead weight loss. They really cash in. So here, there's no horizontal price line. The quote-unquote price line, if you will, is the demand curve. Okay? So they say, you know, there's people who are willing to pay more before. These folks back here who are willing to pay more before, well, we're going to charge them more. Okay, so you take away that consumer surplus and it all becomes a monopoly profit. See how that works? It was just this. They took away that consumer surplus and then they also found a way to add the um, dead weight loss by charging, or, or excuse me, by, um, uh, by, by going um, in a competitive uh, maximizing all the way out into a competitive situation where supply equals demand here, they take advantage of that um, dead weight loss area that they would have lost. They capture that, and they also capture the consumer surplus by charging people who are willing to pay more, they charge them more. And then as people are willing to pay less, they charge them less. And so they charge different people, um, if this is the market demand curve, uh, different prices so they capture this whole area so you got all kinds of people paying different things for the same product the monopolist captures all the consumer surpluses as, as profit and then also there's no dead weight loss because they've captured that as well by charging people less way out here so at each quantity the height of the demand curve shows the marginal buyers willingness to pay so the next buyer is willing to pay this when the next buyer is willing to pay that and the next buyer is willing to pay this price and they just capture it all okay so this is the price that the monopolist charges the buyer under perfect price discrimination. Now price discrimination in the real world, in the real world, perfect price discrimination is not really possible. No firms know every, there's not a firm that knows every buyer's willingness to pay. It's just something you just can't capture. And buyers are not willing to reveal it to sellers. It's not like you just kind of stupidly walk up to someone and say, hey, I'll pay this. You, you walk up to somebody and say, how much is this? Um, so firms divide customers in, into groups based on some observable trait that is likely related to willingness to pay, such as age. Um, people that are you know, maybe really young may not pay as much. People who are uh, mid-career maybe pay a little bit more. Retirees maybe pay a little bit less. So they kind of, kind of guess. Um, examples of price discrimination that exist. Now, again, this is what we're talking about. There's no real perfect, perfect price discrimination where you can capture all of this. That's perfect. Okay, this perfect price discrimination is just make-believe. It's theory. But there are 
imperfect uh, examples of price discrimination, one being movie tickets. There are discounts for senior citizens, students, and people who can attend during weekday afternoons. And they're all, you know, people with jobs can't really go to the movies in the middle of the day. Um, so they can give preferential treatment to people who can and then charge up on people who can't. So that's price discrimination. They're all, they're all more likely to have lower willingness to pay than people who pay full price on a Friday night. All right, all those folks, the senior students and people who can come middle of the day through the week. Now looking at airline prices is another example of price discrimination. There's discounts for Saturday night stayovers, which help distinguish business travelers who usually have a higher willingness to pay. So from a more past, uh, price sensitive, you know, the casual leisurely travelers are a little more price sensitive so that maybe they'll stay and stay over um, in a city for Saturday night just to save a few bucks whereas a business person's trying to get home to their family so they're willing to pay more to get home so um, airlines can can more or less sort people into these different categories as do movie theaters um, discount coupons another example of price discrimination. People who have time to clip and organize coupons are, are more likely to have lower income and lower willingness to pay than others. Um, if you're a busy person working on Wall Street or something, it's not because you're rich. You just don't have time to sit down and cut out coupons in the, in the, in the uh, newspaper. Your opportunity cost would be too high. You can be doing things that make you more profit than, than coupons save you. Now, need-based financial aid. Low-income families have a lower willingness to pay for their, co for their children's college ed education. And schools price discriminate by offering need-based aid to low-income families and not other types of families. So in this chapter in the, of the textbook, there's a, a new, uh, at least in this edition, in the news box with an excellent article on price discrimination at colleges. It really debunks a common misperception about college costs. I'd like to encourage you to read it, and, discuss, and, and we may even discuss it in class if we get an opportunity um, to, to do so, given its relevancy. Um, now, quantity discounts is another example of price discrimination. In this example, the firm's not really charging different prices to different customers, but charging different prices to the same customer based on that customer's declining willingness to buy additional units. Um, it's easy to buy in bulk when you don't have anything, when, when you don't have any of something. Um, however, if you, as you start to uh, say you can buy in bulk, you can buy pickles in bulk, but once you have about 12 cases of pickles, you don't really want to buy anymore. Now, quantity discounts of buyer's willingness to pay um, as it often declines with additional units, like the pickle example. So firms charge less per unit for large quantities than for small quantities. So they, you think of Costco, and it's like, hey, if you buy four cases, you get to buy it for 30 cents a piece. Um, an example given by the book is a movie theater charges $4 for a small popcorn and $5 for a larger one that's twice as big. So what are you going to do? It looks like a real good deal, so you're going to buy the bigger popcorn. They move more popcorn that way for a dollar. And it keeps the popcorn from getting stale. That's basically what that's about. Now, public policy towards monopolies. Uh, increasing competition uh, with antitrust laws is a goal. So uh, antitrust laws can ban some anti-competitive practices and allow the government to break up monopolies. Um, classic examples of this are the Sherman Antitrust Act from 1890 and the Clayton Act from 1914. Sounds like a long time ago, but that is that is uh, two pieces of legislation that are used on a daily basis um, when when examining monopolies in, in modern day um, in the modern day United States. So you can also have regulation. All right, so government agencies can set a monopolist price. For natural monopolies, the margin cost is less than average total cost at all quantity. So margin cost pricing would result in losses if, you, if you're um, operating under where our, the average total cost were. If so, the regulators might subsidize a monopolist or um, you know, a, a beneficial monopolist that otherwise op operates at a negative. They may actually give them some funds to operate at a positive. Or they could set price equal to average total cost for a zero economic profit. Well, why would they operate? Again, the emphasis there is economic profit, not accounting profit. They're making an accounting profit, but they're making a zero economic profit, which considers opportunity cost. So public policy can prop up a monopoly if it's a good thing, and it can also hold it back if it's a bad thing. 
Now, public ownership, an example of the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, the problem is public ownership is usually less efficient since no profit. Um, since there's no profit, there's no motive to minimize costs. So there's a lot of inefficiencies um, that arise. I'm sure you guys are shocked that I'm pointing out um, the mail service, the U.S. Postal Service has inefficiencies. I'm sure you've never seen that. Um, basically, when something's owned by the public, there's really no CEO or there's no place where the buck stops that um, has somebody that drives efficiency. Now, doing nothing, uh, the foregoing policies have all drawbacks, so the best policy may be no pro policy. Um, I think we've illustrated in class and in these slides several times over that uh, sometimes public policy can do more harm than good, so sometimes it's best to do nothing. Now, in conclusion, the prevalence of a, of a monopoly in the real world, pure monopoly is rare. So the, the situation we described initially here about a pure monopoly is rare. <clears throat> Yet many firms have market power due to things like selling a unique variety of a product, having a large market share, and few significant of competitors. In many of these cases, uh, most of the results from the chapter apply, including the markup uh, of price over marginal cost. So remember to go up to the demand curve and having that prior, that 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 um, that price that's above the marginal cost and marginal revenue intersection. And then also the deadweight loss to society is a big thing. So um, the two key things to remember from uh, the monopoly chapter is obviously the graphs where you have to move uh, the quantities to determine where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, but you have to move price up to the monopoly price where it hits the demand curve. And then also um, in the real world, the big issue is the deadweight loss. Okay, that, that where society could be in a competitive situation versus um, what they lose in terms of quantity and the higher price that they pay. Uh, and the combination of those two things create a dead weight loss. So those are, those are big deals in the real world. So in summary, uh, a monopoly firm is a sole seller in its market. Monopolies arise due to barriers to entry, including government-granted monopolies, uh, the, the control of a key resource or economies of scale of an entire range of output, like a, like a natural monopoly, um, like a power company. A monopoly firm faces a downward sloping demand curve for its products. As a result, it, it must reduce price to sell a larger quantity, uh, which causes marginal revenue to fall below price. So you know they're going to operate where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Uh, monopoly firms maximize profits by producing quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Uh, but since marginal revenue is less than price, the monopoly price will be greater than marginal cost, leading to a dead weight loss. Okay, lower quantity, higher price, dead weight loss to society. Monopoly firms and other fir others with market power, say oligopolies, try to raise their profits by charging higher prices to consumers uh, with their with higher willingness to pay. Okay, they try to capture that that perfect price discrimination and and get every bit of the juice out of the lemon. So this practice is called price discrimination. Policymakers may respond by regulating monopolies using antitrust laws to promote competition and by taking over a monopoly and running it. All right? Due to problems with each of these options, the best option may be to take no action and let the market sort it out. I don't know. It's up for debate. There's situations where I could see that working. There's situations where I could not. So um, this concludes the PowerPoint video lecture for the monopoly chapter. And, um, you know, it certainly can have some great discussion around. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or drop by. Thanks so much.